So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my father who is in heaven. Father God, thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to preserve this for us. And we pray that you'd use this today in a way that would lead us, that would guide us, that would instruct us. Uh, would you take my time of preparation, your faithfulness, and allow it to speak to our hearts and to our minds and to equip us for the mission that you have sent us on, Jesus. It is in your glory that we pray. Amen. Well, here we are in the Gospel of Matthew as Jesus is continuing his instructions for those that he's going to send out. His 12 disciples that he's called to them, that they've walked with him, they've, they've been instructed by him, and now he is commissioning them out as apostles, messengers, sent ones to go and proclaim the message of the kingdom that is at hand, the message that brings with it a supernatural power to heal, to cleanse, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. Things that the disciples, as they've seen Jesus walk and do ministry, they've seen this power to hand. And now Jesus is giving all authority and power to those that have followed him, that are now being equipped with this supernatural power to go and do this work of seeing the kingdom come to fruition, seeing people come to faith, and yet it is not without opposition. You see, he tells his, his disciples, his apostles, that they're going to be going on a mission, and they're going to have this mission, and as Jesus is giving them instructions, he sees the mission at hand, but he sees it with the end in sight. And he gives them this warning. It's going to be full of pitfalls. It's going to be full of opposition and resistance. You will be dragged before governors and kings. Your family will turn against you. They will give each other over to death. There will be persecution. This is the promise that Jesus is giving them. So here we have a message where there will be a proclamation of the kingdom at hand. And yet there will be persecution and death. And why? We looked at this last week. Why will there be this persecution? this judgment, this death, this opposition, well, it was all for his name's sake. It is because of these apostles and their willingness to go on this mission and to identify with Jesus, the King, the Savior, the, the Messiah who would bring in this new kingdom, because of their alignment with him, they will face persecution. So it is for his name's sake. And it begs a couple of questions up right up front. What right did Jesus have to send his messengers on such an ill-fated mission and bid them gladly to die for him? Why in the world would they go? That's the second question. And why would they go even joyfully? So what right did he have? Well, he has the right simply because up front we need to know that he is the Son of God. Jesus is giving this message to his disciples as sent ones to be able to go and proclaim this message on mission to the world. And he is doing it with the end in sight. And he knows what his fate will be. He knows what he has come to accomplish. And so he can call his people to go on this mission equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit because he is the Son of God. He knows that he will lay his life down for us. Otherwise, he is not entitled in any way to say, do my bidding even if it leads you to death. It's only because he was willing to go there for his apostles, his disciples, for you and I that then we can then step into that. So his servants then find their inspiration in the absolute unconditional surrender and that Jesus in love died for them. You see, there's a change that takes place in these disciples. We see that after the death and the resurrection and the ascension, we see that after Pentecost, after the arrival of the Holy Spirit, where they're empowered, where they're given uh, this incredible supernatural power to take and carry out this mission, and they're changed. And in this way, because they've seen what Jesus has done for them, they are then inspired to this unconditional self-surrender of love. 
And the very thing that would give Jesus the right to send his disciples into the world with the message that will surely be rejected, it will surely face opposition, it will surely face resistance, is the very motivation for his messengers to yield their lives to him and to say, whether I live or I die, I'm with Jesus. I belong to the Lord. So in this section of the passage, what we see is that Jesus is sending his disciples with the end in sight. The mission then is being widened. You see, he first commissioned them to just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And now as he's looking down the corridor of time, what he can see is that the mission is going to expand. It's going to go to Jews and to Gentiles. It's going to go to Judea and to Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. The great commission that he gives to his people in Matthew 28, go and make disciples, baptize them. And then the expanding geographical region and over time, they would go to all the ends of the earth. The same mission that you and I have been commissioned to do. So this gospel message of the coming kingdom of Jesus as our savior, the one who would die for our sins, the one that would empower us by the Holy Spirit to give and deliver this message to a desperately needing world. That here he says, have no fear. And that's the point of the passage today. He wants to empower his disciples so that they can walk not in fear, but to walk in assurance. And I love how Jesus does this in this passage. What he does is he gives them the reasons why they don't need to be afraid because they have the assurance that he is with them, that he loves them deeply, and that he will equip them. So let's take a look at our passage here. Picking up then in verse 26. So have no fear of them. Who is the them? These are the people that would drag them before governors and kings. These are the people that would cause anxiety for them because they would persecute them. They would revile them. They would cast stones and they would insult at them. So it's those people, the people that would be against this gospel message. Have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. What in the world is he saying here? Well, this is the first of the the three fear knots that we have in this passage. And each time it's given with a reason. And these encouragements then are given so that we might know, and particularly this one, might know that the things that have been said in the quiet, the things that have been said in the dark, the things that have been whispered, they cannot continue to be covered. They will, in fact, be revealed. And here's what he's pointing out. This truth, the truth of who he is, the truth that he is the Savior, The truth of this message and mission, it will not be concealed. It will not be covered. It will not be hidden. It will not be veiled in darkness. It will not be whispered. It will be revealed. It will be known. It will be the light of the world and it will be proclaimed on the mountaintops. Jesus has said to his 12, this 12 said to all of Galilee, and then the Holy Spirit through Pentecost then took this message out to the nations. And now this mission has widened to every corner of the earth. Just think of it as like a small spark that is now set ablaze a wildfire. And here we are connecting the dots because if you recall back when Jesus began his ministry in Matthew 5, what ended up happening is that he, he was going around and it says that he was teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And he saw the people gathered around, and so he went up and he began to teach them. That's what we see, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. And one of the things that he said towards the end of that instruction is, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. There it is again, for my name's sake, on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then he goes on to say these instructions, that you are to be salt to the world. You are to be light to the darkness. And you see then, maybe these disciples, you got to think that maybe they're connecting some of the dots. Recalling back on the teaching when Jesus says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And you wouldn't light a lamp and then hide it under a basket. You see, the things of the kingdom are going to be revealed, and that is the first assurance that we have. We don't need to worry. We don't need to be afraid because we have the assurance through God and his providence and his power that this message will not be concealed, but the truth, in fact, will be revealed. 
we actually see this as well in Paul's letter to Romans, where he talks about the power of the gospel, that he's not ashamed of it because the power of the gospel is salvation to everyone who would believe. But he says there is a, a pressure against, there's opposition to this truth. And that is that unrighteousness will press against the truth of God's word. And there will be an attempt to suppress the truth. We read this in Romans 1, that by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. But the truth will not be concealed. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to everyone. It's plain to them that attempt to conceal this truth because God has shown it to them. And it's, it's available for all of us to see in verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. You see, the things around us, nature and the way that God has created everything reveals to this very truth of who God is, his divine attributes and his power. So we don't need to be afraid because God's truth will not, in fact, cannot be concealed. It will not be hidden. It will be known and it will not be whispered. It will be proclaimed on the mountaintops. So then the second fear not that we have is in verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is a rather dark statement that Jesus gives to his followers. But it's one again embedded in truth. It's one built on the fact that you have a body and a soul and the people that are coming around you that would persecute you, that would revile you, that would seek to kill you, all they can do is hurt you in bodily and temporary forms. But Jesus, the judge of all, is he is the one that will be able to rescue your soul. And so he introduces this idea of not fearing man, but fearing the Lord. And what is the fear of man? It is the thing that often drives us. This is the thing that often asks us the question, what will people think of me? And it's a fear because it's often a, a motivator that plays out in our everyday lives. And that's one of the great tools about fear is that it does help reveal and demonstrate our motives and how we operate in our day-to-day -day life. And what does fear of man create? It creates this anxiety in us. It creates a depression. It creates all sorts of angst and unease because we are constantly trying to evaluate what do they think about me? What will I, how will I be perceived in this? Will I be good enough? Can I meet their expectations? I mean, today people are riddled with anxiety because it's driven by this motivation to want to be pleasing and acceptable to their peers. It's brutal. We see this play out in social media all the time. Now contrast that. That's the fear of man. But then there's this, also this concept of the fear of the Lord. It's a, actually, it's a hard one for many of us to understand. So let me take a moment just to describe what the fear of the Lord is. Fear is actually described in, in the Bible in a few different ways. There's three I really wanna focus in on in ways that it relates to how we would fear the Lord. The first one is that it would be this idea of being scared. Scared as in a frightening situation where you would tremble in fear in the sense of being frightened, scared, you feel like you're in danger. So that's the first one, so to be scared. The second would be a sense of respect. It's to serve with sincerity and faithfulness, somebody that you would honor, somebody that you would respect, somebody that you would look up to. There's a, a sense in which the Bible uses the language of fear in that way, where that you, would, you would desire to submit to that person because of a deep sense of respect for them for the way they care for you, the way they treat you, the way they do their work in an honorable fashion. I can follow that person. That's a sense of fear that's described in the Bible. And the third one is reverence or awe. Now this one is much more in the sense of you know that you are in the presence of something powerful. You know that you are in front of the creator God, that you are in awe. You know that you are of no value in the sense of cannot compete with the power that is in, present, in, that is in front of you. A great example where we see this level of fear, this level of reverence or awe is in Isaiah. When Isaiah is confronted by the Lord, he has this vision where he sees the glory of the Lord fill the temple. And he is broken. He says, woe to me, for I am unworthy. I am a man of unclean lips. 
I, I cannot even stand in your presence. You are so majestic and powerful. So that sense of reverence or awe is another way in which the Bible describes fear. So what is the fear of the Lord? Well, actually, it, it, it is a combination of all three of these. It is a way in which that we might be terrified in some sense because we know that the Lord has a real sense of judgment, a real sense of power. There is a respect because there is a God who would deal with us in such just and honorable and faithful ways that we would be willing to follow out of a desire to emulate and be like. And there's also this great sense of majesty and reverence. God, you are all powerful. You are the creator and your strength is on display. All three of those come together to be brought into this concept of the fear of the Lord. So then we have our second sense of assurance. We are not to have, the first one is that we would have the assurance that the gospel message would feel every ear, fill every ear, ear, that we would have no fear because we know that the message will continue, that the truth will not be concealed. And here we have our second do not fear that, that which can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul. So we have really then the assurance of the limitation of the enemy's power to harm you. When Jesus speaks of this idea of your body being harmed, it is only temporary, it's only bodily, but it cannot destroy the soul. And so our fear of the Lord is actually a great assurance that we can have. Now, what is, what is the fear of the Lord as we see it play out a couple times in Scripture? A very obvious passage, if you're familiar with this, is the fear of the Lord. It's described in Proverbs 1. It is the beginning of knowledge. And here, Solomon, inspired by the Spirit, gives us a contrast. So if we have the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of knowledge. But fools, on the other hand, they despise wisdom and instruction, or other, uh, other translations would say discipline. So fools would turn against wisdom and discipline or instruction, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and it creates and cultivates in us then wisdom and discipline and instruction and knowledge. We read in Psalm 111 that fearing of the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom. And then here in Proverbs 1 again at the end, there's a contrast that's being given. And in verse 29, it picks up, here's what it looks like for those that would not trust in the Lord, those that would not have a wisdom and a knowledge of who God is built on and, and, and cultivated into a fear of the Lord. And he says, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despise all my reproof, therefore they shall eat of the fruit of their way and they'll have fill of their own desires, chasing after their own desires, their own motivations often being driven by fear of man instead of fear of the Lord. So instead of hearing the counsel of the Lord, instead of receiving that instruction and that discipline and turning away from the fear of the Lord, chasing after the things of this world, well, what do they get? They get to eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own desires. For the simple are killed by the turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. So contrasting that with the fear of man, what does the fear of the Lord produce? Well, it produces a wisdom, it produces knowledge, it produces discipline, and it brings comfort and peace. That's why Jesus, when he says, have no fear, and said, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul and hell. Fear the one who has power to judge. Fear the one who is the creator what does that fear produce? Well, it doesn't produce a trembling in terms of a being scared. It produces a fruitfulness of your life. And when we do that, when we can understand that God has such deep desires for us to care for us and to instruct us in that, we can know that that's a demonstration of his perfect love. And I love in 1 John where he writes that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, fear of this world. But that's motivated by a right understanding of the fear of the Lord. So this very concept of being loved is actually the third point. So in verse 29, Jesus then goes into this kind of little example, and it feels a little bit off track, or uh, he's, he's off on a tangent of sorts, but he brings it back. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs in your head are numbered. Well, what is Jesus talking about here? 
because you just went from eternal judgment to now talking about sparrows and our hairs. And here's the assurance that he wants to give us. You are known and that you are loved. You see, God is over all. He's informed by all. He is all powerful. And he's all present. And so nothing happens outside of his understanding. So not even a bird that would be so worthless as a penny for a dove or two or a sparrow that would fall to the ground would happen outside of the understanding of the Father. So too, Jesus says, even the hairs on your head are known by your Father in heaven. Even those hairs are counted. Well, it seems a little extravagant, doesn't it? But here's the point. God knows you intimately and deeply in every detail of you. Every person has about 100,000 hairs on average, some more, some less. But if about 100,000 hairs and there's about 8 billion people, if I do the math right, it means that we've got about 800 trillion known hairs on the earth right now. I know it's kind of a ludicrous example, but that's the point of what Jesus is saying. He's saying God even knows the finite, intimate details of your life, even down to counting of a, of a single hair, that he would know that, that he would be able to understand you. Why? Because he is the one that has created us. You see, this passage reveals some unique and fundamental attributes of God's character. Where we saw in Romans 1 that his his divine attributes have been clearly perceived by us. Here we're also seeing that God is all-knowing, he's all-present, and he's all-powerful. He knows the number of hairs on your head, and he is the all-powerful creator who has architected you and is familiar with every single detail of you down to the very hairs on your head. And it's not just with you right now in this time and place, but everywhere for all time and all places. So the omniscience the omnipotence, the omnipresence of God is on display. So here Jesus then says in verse 31, Therefore, fear not. Why? Because you are of more value than many sparrows. And here we have our third assurance. It is the tender love of the Lord. You have been intricately, in, intricately formed. You, have been, you are intimately known and that you are deeply Love. Scripture even speaks to this. We read in Psalm 139, this is a picture of David. He's giving praise to the Lord and he's giving credit to God of the way that he was formed, the way that he was created. And in Psalm 139, verse 13, David says this, You formed my inward parts and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully, there's our word again, and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. As yet, there was none of them. Even before the beginning of time, David says, God, you knew me. You crafted me together. You wove me together in my mother's womb. You know every detail of me. And he would go on to say, search me. You know every part of me, both the way that I've been created, but also the motives of my heart, the thoughts in my head, the actions I've done, the words I've spoken. I'm known. I am known fully by you. From the, even from the very, very beginning. But it's one thing to be known. It's another thing to be known and loved. Isaiah, a prophet sent by God, to be able to call his people back to him, back to the covenant relationship that he had offered to them, to demonstrate his love. Here again, we see the way that God is speaking out to them. Don't be afraid, but know that you are loved. In Isaiah 43, God says this through the prophet, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine, fulfilling this promise that he would make to his people that I will be your God and you will be my people, a people for my own possession. He would say that you're going to pass through waters and I'll be with you. Harkening back to the time when God led his people through safety through the waters. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned. I will be present with you and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Again, God revealing himself to them. This is because you are precious in my eyes. I honor you and I love you. So when Jesus says, 
you're more valuable than a couple of birds. He's not just saying you're worth a few pennies. What he's saying is you're worth everything to me. You're worth everything. I'm willing to lay my life down for you. The greatest demonstration of love that this world has ever seen is that the Father would send his Son for you and for me. And that is the message of the gospel. That God doesn't demand this perfection on our own. Instead, he would send Jesus to live the life that we could not live. He died the death that we should have died, and he conquered death by being raised from the grave, and he is seated now in glory, and there will be judgment. But it's a judgment out of love. It's a judgment out of justness because, and justice because there is a, 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 a deep desire for God to draw people to himself. Many of you believe the fact that you're not loved, the fact that you're, you're not good enough, that you disappoint God. You see, we'll get to this in a moment, but when, when God sees you, what he sees is the righteousness of Christ. That's what it is to be in Christ. And that is a message that I just want you to hold on to. If there's one thing you hear today is that you are known fully and you are loved. And that is such a contrast that is so hard for us because we know in the depths of our hearts, if you knew everything about me, clearly I would be rejected. If you knew the depth of my sin, if you knew my thoughts, if you knew the things I've tried to keep hidden, the shame that I carry in God says, I know it all. And I love you so, so deeply that I would send Jesus for you. That's why we don't have to be afraid. You see how the fear that this world manifests, the fear of shame and condemnation is counteracted by a fear that is even greater, and that is the fear of God that produces in us a deep assurance that we are fully known and that we are fully loved. There's a, a mission and a message that, he, that Jesus gives to his disciples here. And it is built on this idea of love. And because there is this this picture of being brought into God's family and that we are equipped with the Spirit then, in the same way Paul writes to us in, in the letter to the church in Rome, it's the same idea then of, as the apostles to be sent out with power and that they're going to be facing opposition in the world that's going to hate them and there's going to be suffering that's promised in that. How are we to then respond to it? Well, Paul writes about this. He writes in, verse, in chapter 8, in verse 16, and leading up to this, he says that we have received the Spirit of God and allows us to know that we have been adopted into God's family, those that would place their hope and their trust in Jesus. And we are then called co-heirs. And we read in verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are, we are what? We are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ that we receive the deposit of the Holy Spirit that guarantees the inheritance that we have, that we've been brought in, adopted into God's family, co-heirs with Christ. But he gives a condition here. It's not a condition of our inheritance or our, our being heirs with Christ, but it's the, here's a promise of what this will look like. Provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And this is where we get to our last point then that we will face a judgment. Jesus was saying to his disciples that everyone that acknowledges me before men, I'll also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever would deny me before men, I'll also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You see, this is what Jesus was telling his people, that there's going to be opposition, there's going to be persecution, and the reason you will receive that opposition and that rejection and the persecution it's for, it's for my name's sake. We read that in Matthew 22, Matthew 10, 22. You will be hated by all. Why? For my name's sake. But for the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Those that would acknowledge me, Jesus says, in front of men to the very end, those that would endure to the end, those that would run that race to the very end, there will be a reward that you will be with me. And what does that look like? It looks like the recognition that Jesus says that when we then have to go and have judgment in front of the Father, that when we step in there, Jesus says, no, 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 they're with me. And the righteousness, the perfection, the holiness of God is then applied to you and to I. 
That's this beauty of this picture of adoption, of being co-heirs with Christ, that we've been invited in, we've been equipped with the power of the Spirit, given a message of salvation to proclaim that the kingdom of God is at hand. And we do that to the very end, even in the midst of opposition and hatred and reviling and persecution, even to the point of death. And that's the amazing example that these apostles said is all of them faced trials to the very end. And all of them were willing to lay their life down for the name of Jesus, for his sake. So Jesus gives us this final assurance. If you acknowledge me in front of men, I will acknowledge you in front of the Father. I will apply my perfection to you. That is the seal of salvation that you will have. So that which would be said in secret, our thoughts, our actions, our motivations, they'll all be exposed in that day. That day when we stand in front of the Father, but it is the intimate love of God and the empowering work of the Spirit that will provide us with an assurance that will allow you and I to carry out that mission to the very end. And what is the mission? It is to proclaim the good news of who Jesus is. That's why he can say that we don't need to be afraid. Three times in this passage, he tells them, you will face opposition, but have no fear. And you can walk in the assurance that this message will go out, that the truth will not be concealed. We don't have to be afraid because what can man do to us but mock us and revile us and maybe destroy the body, but that's temporary and it is only bodily. And the last one is that we can be assured by the tender love of the Lord. So here's my encouragement to you. As we all are messengers, as we all are ambassadors, as we all have been sent, commissioned by our Lord and King Jesus to proclaim his salvation to the world. And as we face this opposition, as we step into these trials, that we would be like those that have gone before us, that we would take courage and that we would run the race with endurance. Paul gives this charge to his disciple that he is caring for and nurturing and mentoring. Timothy, who he established as a pastor over many congregations in Ephesus, these are his words, the, the dying words that he would give to his son in this sense, his spiritual son, as he would call Timothy. These are the words that he has for Timothy, and they are helpful for us. You see, Paul is at the end of his life. He says, I'm, I'm being poured out as a drink offering, and my time of my departure has come. So the final instructions he gives to Timothy is, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, do what? Preach the word. Proclaim Christ. Be ready. Be ready in season. Be ready out of season. That you are to reprove, rebuke, exhort, and do this with complete patience and teaching along the way. This is the instructions to a pastor. But it's applicable for all of us. For the time is coming that people are not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to gather for them people that will tell them things that they want to hear. They'll, they'll have people confirm their own biases. They're going to turn away from listening to the truth, he says. But for you, for you, O Timothy, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. So Paul says this, Basically, is the closing line of his life in this sense. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. That's my hope and desire for each one of you. As it is going to be hard that we can have the assurances that God is with us, that he is for us, that his message will continue and that we are known and loved and cared for by the Father. The author of Hebrews says it well in this. How do we do this? How do we run this race? How do we finish well? How do we keep the faith to the very end? Well, we need to know that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, people that have gone before us that have kept the faith. That we are to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, but instead that we are to do this. We are to what? We are to run with endurance the race that is set before us. What is that race? It is the race of proclaiming this message and that we are to look to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who went before us and it was for the joy that was set before him, he was willing to go to the cross. 
And in doing so, he despised the shame. And where is he now? He's seated in the right hand of God. My friends, we will face persecution. We will face opposition. And we will be afraid. It's a natural response. But I love Jesus' words and his encouragement, his equipping for his people. It was true for the apostles then. It's true for you and I now. Sent ones carrying this message. We don't have to be afraid. For our God is with us. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you have intricately woven us, that you've known us before even the advent of time. And yet you know every single detail. You know every thought, you know every motivation. Every aspect of who we are is on display in front of you. It cannot be concealed. And God, you also love us. You love us perfectly. You love us fully. You love us deeply. And so when you call us and send us out into this field, this mission field with a message that will surely have opposition and trials and persecution, it's promised. We know that we're not sent out just simply as sheep to be slaughtered by wolves, but we are to be sent out equipped with the power of your message, the power of your spirit, and the great assurances that your truth will not be concealed, that the enemy can only harm us in temporary and bodily ways, but you are stronger and mightier and can preserve our soul and that we are fully known and fully loved by you. Father, thank you for these assurances through the words of your spirit spoken by your son, Jesus. I pray that we would find great comfort and hope and courage in this message. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.